Right, good morning everyone and welcome to this version of a lecture. So please, just before I begin, I want you to be aware that on Are You Connected, I've got um, quantum mechanics notes that are there. And just have a look at that, these um, yeah, third year notes. And if you look carefully, I've annotated sections to try and highlight what's important and what's maybe uh, less important and what's more important. Um, there's a section which has a relation to the textbook and sections, if you've got Atkins available, uh, what's interesting, what will uh, enrich uh, your knowledge in this section. Um, and there are some objectives um, and just go through them as we go through the course so you get an idea of, of, of what's important in that. Um, the way I've set this up is if you move down, um, there's free information, which we'll come to in a moment, but you'll see like uh, for the failures of classical mechanics, is look for the gray sections and uh, I, I, I then spell out what's important and, and what you need to concentrate on in each section. So in some cases we, we I feel that, that, that the, the work is not so essential for what we're dealing with. I'll tell you maybe to gloss over a certain section what you need to know and what you don't need to know from that. Okay, so please have a look at that and also read the relevant, it, it parallels the lectures quite a lot. So you can enrich uh, work from the lectures by uh, having a look at that. Okay, and just um, uh, also have a look. Um, if you have not done complex numbers for a long time, uh, just um, have a look at the uh, revision that I've got on complex numbers. What's really important towards the end is Euler's formula, where you've got uh, e to an imaginary e to the i theta and how that can be expanded. That's really important. And of course, in the notes as well, um, I also expand on that as well. So please just remind yourself of imaginary and complex numbers and what the complex conjugate is. I know in a couple of the lectures I have already referred to the complex con conjugate. Uh, so please uh, have a look at that to remind, remind yourself what I'm um, looking at, what, what I'm uh, talking about. Okay, right, um, on Monday we had a look at some differential calculus and I showed you two very interesting situations where you, you've got an operator and you operate on a function and that function is, is not damaged by the operator, it just has a, a, a factor in front of it at the end and uh, two nice, the exponential functions and cosine and sine functions seem to uh, survive. The cosine and sine seem to survive d2 by dx squared. Uh, exponential seem to survive d by dx. Of course, we spoke a little later on um, of requirements for wave functions. So if we're trying to describe a particle uh, in space in terms of a distribution or a wave function, um, there are certain requirements. And it's not acceptable uh, for uh, the psi in the Schrodinger equation to go to infinity. So if you come back to this, uh, I'm sure you can see that um, something like this might, even though uh, the exponential seems to work, something like a cosine or a sine will work a lot better in fulfilling that, fulfilling that requirement, that maybe an exponential. Uh, you can imagine if, if this was trying to describe an orbital for an atom uh, um, or an electron in an atom, you would end up, as you go along the x-coordinate, uh, having an infinite, uh, if you went too far right, the density would go up and up. You would not be able to find a probability um, of other places. So this is not uh, going to be acceptable. Um, in terms of that requirement. Okay, and of course, uh, yesterday we had uh, explored that the uh, Schrodinger wave equation and what it looks like in 
one dimension. And it's interesting that it's, it's simply the second derivative um, of the function. Multiply it with uh, something that's constant in front of it, um, plus the potential, which in some cases, like today, we're going to deal with the case where the potential is naught, the particle's free to move. So it becomes a, a, a slightly slim, simpler form um, than uh, what it appears there. And of course, I want you to be able to recognize what happens in three dimensions. Okay. And I had a little bit of a contrived example um, uh, talking about multiple choice answers. And I'll just, before I continue, I'll just remind you of that. Uh, that if I were to say to you, if I were to say to you, what answer is a student going to give for the multiple choice? Um, you'd probably say that that's not a very intelligent question because you, you're you not certain. However, across the whole class, you, you, you've got a probability distribution. So if you say, well, uh, what percentage of the class is likely to answer A? That's a more sensible question. You can say, well, hang on, 20%. Uh, around about 20% are going to answer A on the multiple choice. But for any individual student, you can't say he's going to answer A, B, C, or D, or E. Um, it only makes sense when you've got a, a, an ensemble, when you've got a whole lot of uh, data to work from. And um, so it's a similar case in, in quantum mechanics. You're not asking, is a particle at A, B, C, D, or E? Uh, if you were taking a measurement, um, you couldn't predict where it was going to be. Uh, but if you took a whole lot of measurements, you could say, well, hang on. Um, the probability it's going to be at A is going to be this, and the probability at B is going to be that, and so on. So it, it's uh, going more towards probabilities than it is towards actual uh, defined places. Okay. So today what I want to do is I want to go back to the Schrodinger wave equation. And there it is, right at the top. I want to go to it, and what we're going to do is we are going to uh, use it in the case of a particle that is free to move in the x direction. Okay, so the wave function that you get at the end of it uh, looks something like this, a to the e chi, a to the e i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. Now, um, that i, um, of course, is the imaginary number, and if you have a look at Euler's relationship, you'll see that these translate to a, a sum of a cosine plus i sine um, of x, of kx. So these um, really are in the forms of sines and cosines. So you see, if we want to have a look at what is an eigenfunction of d2 by dx squared, we saw that cosine works well. If you d by dx, it becomes sine. When you d2 by dx, it becomes minus uh, cosine. So uh, sine and cosine work really well with d2 by dx squared. And also, e to the something also works quite well because it works uh, well as an eigenfunction. However, remember that e to the x alone uh, goes off to infinity. So there's a problem with it. However, e to the i k x, because it's a sine and cosine, it doesn't go off to infinity. So to satisfy us one of the requirements, you have a wave function so that it doesn't go off to infinity. So this is the most general you can have because this includes almost anything you can think of that will work in this d2 by dx squared. So in terms of uh, exponentials, in terms of sines and cosines, and in terms of also uh, uh, not going off to infinity. And of course, a and b are constants, so you can choose what you like. So you could choose naught there and have a simple version. You could make a equal to b. If a is equal to b, then you've got a beautiful cosine function. It, it simplifies to a beautiful cosine function. If you've got a is minus b, then this simplifies to a beautiful sine function, and so on. So um, you've got a lot of choice what you can choose. Um, uh, this is very, very general. Uh, in terms of a wave function. It's the, the most general we can possibly have. And let's just check. I think maybe the first thing we need to do is we need to 
check that it is, it does work as an eigenfunction um, in this equation. So the Schrodinger wave equation, uh, if it's free to move, we've got no potential. So we're going to have h bar squared over tm, d2 psi by dx squared. We must make sure that the psi is not damaged uh, by uh, that d2 by dx squared. Okay. So just uh, to do a little of a work, we just need to know what happens if we do d by dx twice on the first bit and d2 by dx uh, twice, d by dx twice in the second bit. And so you can see that the inside brackets is where I did once, and there's the result of doing it once. And you can see the i and the k, the constant comes out in front. And when I do it twice, the i and the k comes out twice, and you can see the function is undamaged. And of course, i squared is, i is the square root of minus one, so i squared gets us back to minus one. So you can see here, a e to the i k x is undamaged by this d2 by dx squared. So uh, d2, by dx, d2 by dx squared does not damage it, and we get an eigenvalue um, out of it. Similarly for b e to the minus i k x, it's undamaged when it comes out. I've left out a minus at the top there, so please put it in. Uh, that doesn't change at all. But of course, um, uh, what happens is that the uh, uh, minus comes out, and so you end up with uh, minus k squared times the undamaged function. So that's a little bit of a legwork. And so if we wanted to do d2 by dx squared of a whole lot, we would add those two together. So we know that d2 by dx squared of that does not damage the function. We've just got a multiple in front of it. Um, and so both of these are um, eigenvalue um, equations. You've got an operator times an eigenfunction, and we've got an eigenvalue coming out of it. So of course, if we put them together, it also is going to become uh, an eigenvalue equation. So Let's try and put those two functions right into the Schrodinger wave equation. There's the Schrodinger wave equation that we've got. We say that our wave function can be in its most general form, something like that. And if we choose the A's and B's nicely, we can get uh, whatever we thought we really wanted. If we wanted a cos, we could get the cosine function, we could get that. If we wanted a sine, we can get it. If we wanted an exponential, we can have it. Uh, We've got, but let's see if we can get it to work on this very, very general wave function. And we can, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in onto the left hand side. So, onto the left hand side, we've got a d2 by dx multiplied by a constant times psi. And so, I'm going to take the constant out and try and do that. Try and do d2 by dx squared of that. And of course, we did it on the parts. So, previous slide, I've just transferred the answer I got for uh, doing d2 by dx squared of the first part and d2 by dx squared of the second part. I've transferred that across. And then, of course, I can take out this common minus k squared into the front. And you'll notice that um, when I take that constant out, can you see that there is our function. Our function is undamaged. It is not damaged by the uh, operator we have. We just have a, uh, a multiple. And so we ended up with the uh, multiple in front of psi as being h bar squared k squared over 2m times psi. And that must be e psi. And so we can then deduce that the total energy is h bar squared k squared over 2m. So uh, what's happened is we've used the Schrodinger wave equation uh, and that Schrodinger wave equation has told us two things. It's told us that our choice of psi is good. That choice of psi, that very general choice of psi is very good because um, it works. It maintains an eigenvalue equation. And uh, the second thing we can get from it is an actual value for the energy of that particle. And the energy of the particle is dependent on the k constant that we've got over there. So depending on the k that we've got, k could be any energy. Um, uh, k, k could be any value. So the energy could change of the particle. Uh, but the particle is the 
energy of the particle is also dependent on the mass of that particle. Okay, so this is very useful. Uh, uh, we have a particle, maybe an electron, just moving along the x-axis, moving from, um, not sure how it's moving, but it's moving, it's not constrained uh, by any potential, and we can confirm that uh, the Schrodinger wave equation is working. It's still an eigenvalue equation, so the wave function is correct. And we can get an energy for the particle out of that. So depending on the K, uh, would, 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 it would influence what the energy is. Okay. So there's another thing that we can do uh, with uh, the wave function is there's another operator that's not the H operator. Remember, uh, in, uh, in the Schrodinger wave equation, we've got H, which is T plus V, and that operator gets at the energy out of it. But there are other, other, other eigenvalue equations we can use that get other in useful information out of the psi, out of the wave function. And one interesting operator is the momentum operator. And the momentum operator is really straightforward. Um, it's just d by dx of psi um, and multiplied by uh, h bar over i. And of course, if we've got our eigenfunction that's not damaged by this, then the multiple we get in front is our momentum. So, um, so we can try and use this momentum operator on our wave function to see if we can't find the momentum of the particle. Now, to make things simpler, I'm going to try and cut our wave function down into pieces. So what if A is, what if B is naught? If B is naught, then your wave function is this valid wave function. It's still, uh, it's still valid. And what if A is naught? Let's see if we can calculate the momentum in these two different cases. Well, to calculate the momentum in these two cases, we've got to um, calculate uh, that d by dx of the thing and multiply it by h over i. And d by dx of an exponential is easy. We've done that before. Um, and so just notice that the i coming out here will cancel with the i at the bottom. And we'll end up with um, h k and um, M is the result we get when we do uh, d by dx times h over i times psi, if we operate on psi, the multiple we get at front is h bar times k. Now, we said that the multiple in front that you get from that operator, if it's an eigenvalue equation, is the momentum. So that value we've got in front after using the momentum operator must be the momentum. So the momentum when size a e to the i case is h times k, h bar times k. But you do the same thing for the other side and you end up with the momentum being minus h bar times k. So what does this mean? How do we interpret this? So I'm going to go back a slide and just remind you where we come from. We've used that operator d by dx of our psi in two cases, and of course uh, the d by dx part comes really nicely, um, and we get a constant out in front, and of course we have to multiply it by h bar of i, but of course whatever the multiple of psi we get is the momentum. So we were able to calculate the momentum in two cases. So the momentum in the first case is h bar k, the momentum in the second case is minus h bar k. What does that mean? It means that if the wave function is like this, the particle is moving forwards. If the wave function is like that, the particle is moving in reverse. So what we have is that uh, we've got some useful information. So um, some special cases of the wave function when B is naught, it's moving forward. When A is naught, the particle is moving in reverse. And what is nice about this is that 
we know exactly we can calculate exactly the momentum of the particle and here it is and um, if your wave function has a particular value of k in that then you know the exact value of its momentum of the momentum of that particle and similarly for the reverse so that's quite nice because if your particle is free to move yes it can move forward and backward and um, and so we can calculate the momentum for that okay however um, i did say that if you do psi squared or rather the psi conjugate psi um, that tells you uh, the probability density um, it tells you uh, where the particle is so that's the second thing i'd like to do is let's have a look at the forward particle let's see can we find out where that forward particle is and so we're going to have to do psi star spy and so to do that we need the complex conjugate of psi which is uh, the imaginary part negative at times the uh, psi itself and you'll find that uh, these two cancel out and you're left with a squared similarly um, if you try and find the probability density for the this function you'll find that the middle cancels out and you get the probability density is d squared. Okay, um, so uh, there's a question. Are we just making A or B naught for simplification purposes or is there another reason for momentum? Um, I'm just, all I'm doing now is I'm trying things. So I'm saying, well, what if A is naught and what if B is naught? And they have very interesting consequences. So the question is, why am I making A naught and why am I making B naught? Um, I'm just trying things. And it's interesting that if you, um, because um, if we make A naught, we've still got a valid psi because A and B are constants. We make B naught, we still have a valid psi. And I find it really interesting that when you make B naught, uh, it turns out the particles moving forward. And if you make a naught, it turns out the particle's moving in reverse. And so the question that we would have to think about is what if what if they weren't both naught? What if there were something else? And that's a more difficult thing to look at. So these are perhaps the simplest cases we can look at. But of course, when you do psi star psi to find the probability density, you interesting things start happening. Remember that when B was naught, we were able to determine it's moving forward. And we know it's exact, it's exact value for momentum. But however, look at its probability density. Uh, its density, it's, it's like a straight line uh, parallel to the axis. So its density at minus X, at minus uh, X value, is the same as the density at the positive X value. So the problem is, is that it's equally probable to be anywhere along the x-axis. So its probability is independent of position. The bottom line here is we know that this is moving forward. In the strange case where b is naught, we know this is forward and we know exactly what the momentum of a particle is. However, when we do psi, psi, psi or psi squared, um, we find that the probability density is independent of position which means that we have no clue where that particle is and um, it's moving along the x-axis but we do not know where it is and similarly um, if i is naught and we've got the particle moving backwards if we try and find out where it is use psi psi to tell us where it is we get a value that's independent of position either so we don't actually know where where that uh, where where it is okay so that's an interesting um, so I've got another question why is one exponent positive and the other negative in both cases uh, so um, in why is one positive and one negative so in these cases so um, to do if I'm reading your question correctly, um, and just tell me if I'm not, if I'm reading your question correctly, you, you're asking in this situation why you've got a positive and a negative here. 
The reason yeah. is, the reason is, is to get probability density, we have to get rid of imaginary components. A probability is only real. And if you square something like this, if you square something that's imaginary, you end up with something that's still a, got an imaginary component. The only way to get rid of imaginary numbers is to use a complex conjugate, the psi star. And the psi star is easy to make. The complex conjugate is simply, you put a minus sign in front of it. And you can see it's worked. If you put a minus sign in front of the ikx, and you multiply those together, they cancel out to give you something that's only real. And similarly here, where you've got, um, you would have started, I uh, maybe should have put the minus on this side and, and the plus here. So apologies, they should be swapped around. And um, we have a minus here and this should be a plus. And the conjugate is minus minus, which should become a plus and they cancel out to give us B squared. So the probability um, is real. The probability density is a real number. Okay, does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So if I can take us back a, st uh, back, back a step to where we've gone. So first of all, what we did is we confirmed in the Schrodinger wave equation that this wave function is an eigenfunction and we were able to calculate the energy of a particle having that wave function. But we wanted more useful information, like what's the momentum? And to make things a bit simpler, we arbitrarily decided to, well, let's just deal with the one side and make that north and see what happens, and deal with the other side and make that north and see what happens. And as a result of those arbitrary choices, we found that in the one case, we had a particle moving forward, and the other case, we had a particle moving backwards. But in both of those cases, we found that the probability was independent of position, which means that if you tried, if you took a case and you measured where its position was, you'd find it was maybe at minus 10. You measure it again, you find it's at plus 100. You measure it again, you find it's at naught. And, and so every single place in the x, x axis is equally probable. So you do a thousand cases, a thousand experiments, and you find that the position is spread out all over the x-axis. We don't know where that particle is. It's not localized anywhere. Yet, we knew exactly what its momentum is. Its momentum is h bar k moving forward. The momentum here is h bar k moving backwards. That's perfect. We know the momentum exactly, but we don't know where it is. We don't know where that particle is. It's a very interesting case, is that, yes, we know what the wave function has to look like, for a free particle moving. But that wave function has some interesting consequences. And that in some cases, you'll know exactly that the particle is moving forward. You don't know where it is. And you'll know, in some cases, moving backwards. And you know it's, it's exact momentum, but you have no idea where it is, where that particle is. So there's, there's a, a problem, a very strange problem creeping up. So we have two strange situations as a result of this wave function. And two strange situations are, firstly, that in some cases, you have a particle moving forward where you know the momentum precisely, but you don't know where it is. Um, and that's a, a very, very interesting result. Okay. Now I'd like to play a little bit more with this wave function and let's try and choose a, a, an even stranger case where these uh, where these constants are more similar. Let's try another one. So the question is, what if they're equal? And if they're equal, um, if you look back at com complex numbers, you'll know that e to the i k something is cos something plus i sine p something, and e to the minus something um, is cos as something minus the i sine thing or something. So when you add them together, the costs become twice and the signs cancel out. So if a is equal to b, uh, these two work beautifully together to create a cosine function. Um, have a look at Euler's theorem with um, 
each of the eyes something, each of the imaginary something, um, is a combination of cos and sine things. So here's a nice situation, is when we've got A exactly equal to B, uh, beta equal to A, we find that uh, 2A cos Kx is what the wave function comes to. Now, here's an interesting case because you'll remember that the momentum, if we calculate the momentum, it's d by dx. And d by dx of cosine becomes sine. It damages the function. So d by dx damages cos. So this does not work. You can't calculate the momentum on a particle if um, a is equal to b, if you end up. So you can't get any information about momentum if that happens. However, uh, psi, uh, psi squared works really nicely because the conjugate, everything's real here. So you can just square it and you end up with psi, 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 um, psi squared is just a squared cos kx. So here's the wave function as a cos, as a cos. And of course, if we want to know where the particle is, then we're going to square it. And you can square it like that. And you can see over here that you can see there are regions where we're going to be able to find the particle. So the particle is more localized to regions um, along the x-axis. And so this is a really interesting situation where um, psi squared now works. And so we know something about the position. But in this particular case, we know nothing about the momentum. Okay. So if I can just summarize where we've come with this, is that from this particle that moves along the x-axis, we found the wave function to be very generally something like this. And we explored various cases of this wave function that must all work when A is naught, when B and A are the same, when B is naught. When A is naught, we know the momentum, but we don't know where it is. When B is A, we know where it is, but we don't know the momentum. When B is naught, we know the momentum, but we don't know where it, where, where it is. And so um, what we have, um, um, and this really highlights uh, one of the principles that come through in quantum mechanics, and that is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the Heisenberg um, uncertainty principle says that your uncertainty in position uh, times the uncertainty in moment momentum must always be greater than h bar being Planck's constant, over, Planck's constant over 2 pi. What this means is, is that as you get more and more certain about position, as this number gets smaller and smaller, as your uncertainty in position gets smaller and you get a more accurate position, you lose information on what the momentum is on the particle. And vice versa, if you know the momentum better and better and this value gets more slower and lower, your uncertainty gets lower and lower, then of course this has got to increase to keep the total above h bar. So you cannot know uh, both uh, at the same time. And I saw a really great example, uh, uh, illustration um, of how this is. And you will know, of course, that um, if you use trying to use your phone to take a photo of something close up and something far away, it doesn't work. Uh, if you try to take a picture of a pen on your desk, um, you'll see that the pen is perfectly in focus, but of course the background is all blurred. And the more focus and in the more in focus the pen is, the more blurred the background is. And if you focus on the background, if you see the trees and everything in the background, your pen ends up being blurred. You can't get both in focus at the same time with your phone if, you're, if you've got something really close and something really far. And it's a similar situation is that you cannot, you cannot know these two identically. So um, what happens what's interesting is that um, if you've got a wave function that works for a particle moving in space and um, you you might find for another wave function 
uh, using different K's and different A's and B's um, also works. It's interesting that particles can be a superposition of those. And um, one way that Atkins, I think, likes to view things is that uh, if you superimpose various wavelengths onto a certain, uh, as, as your wave function, if you add different cosine functions together, or, uh, for instance, of different wavelengths, the sum then tends to be, uh, have some kind of localization. So the sum would work, the sum over here would also work in Schrodinger's wave equation, that sum would work, but you can see that um, if you add some different wavelengths together, you can see you can start to localize a particle. You can see that the particle is spending its time at the x-axis. But of course, by using different wavelengths, uh, using different momenta, you, you, you're introducing uncertainty in the momenta. Um, and that uncertainty, because there's several different momenta that lead to this, um, you get less certain of the momenta, but you get more certain of the position. And of course, if you add many different wavelengths together, you get become more, more uh, certain of where the position is. And of course, because you've used many different wavelengths, which correspond to different momenta, uh, remember de Broglie, um, if you've got many different wavelengths, uh, uh, many different lambda over NV, uh, then, of course, you've got no information on NV, you've got no information on the momentum, and you've got a lot of information on the position. So uh, position and momentum are complementary variables. They, you can't know them both, certainly, at the same time. Okay. So can I just quickly sum up where we've been through, where we've come from, and where we've gone to this lecture? We... We have started off uh, with the uh, Schrodinger wave equation, but of course it's free to move. A particle is free to move. There's no potential. So we were able to simplify the Schrodinger wave equation down. We've got the most general form of a wave function, of course. Uh, we have then tried some cases. We have had a look at the momentum operator. In the momentum, we've been able to determine the momentum in some cases. And what we find is that, um, uh, if I can just move to this point, is that from that wave function, uh, which works beautifully in Schrodinger's wave, Schrodinger's wave equation, uh, we can do psi squared to find out where it is. And we can only find out where it is perfectly in one place. And that's the case where we don't know the momentum. And, of course, we can find out the momentum in two cases, but, of course, we don't know where it is. And so the big point of this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is where your uncertainty in your momentum and your uncertainty in your position are uh, determined. They have to be greater than H bar. Okay, so that's what I have for today. Are there any questions? Right, if there are no questions, I'm not putting up quizzes on Are You Connected because I would like you to go through my arguments and if there's any points that you're uncertain of in my argument, uh, please drop me an email, um, get further explanation, have a look at the notes that we have um, and I just want you to, uh, it's quite unfamiliar, just get your mind around Maybe try out the maths and confirm that that d2 by dx squared works. Check, check for errors. Check where I've got the, where I'm missing, where I've, I've swapped them around, the minus and the plus. Make sure that that is correct. And um, check that, that you can follow the maths through and that you are happy with the conclusions I make for the maths. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, and then I'll th then we will meet again at nine o'clock tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before I stop, there's a question about the prac. 
Um, the PRAC is, is the complete basis set energy supposed to be higher, lower, or in between E2 and E3, and why? So just uh, that's, that question's come through. Uh, please, um, it has to be lower, but what do I mean by lower? All of these ne energies should be negative. So in task four in the PRAC, all energies should be negative, and the more negative something is, the better that answer is. So the CBS energy should be more negative than any other energy value you get. And if you're not getting an ECBS to be more negative than any other value you've got, just send me a picture of your working out and I can uh, give you advice as to where it's gone wrong. Okay, right. Any other questions? Okay. Right, I'll see you. Prof, um, yeah. please explain the Boltzmann distribution quiz. The Boltzmann distribution quiz. Okay, so in the Boltzmann distribution quiz, I give you, can I just go to it? I'm just going to try and find it quickly. Um, apologies. And so I'm just going to Go on to Are You Connected? And I need to find, uh, just give me a moment, I'll share on Are You Connected? Um, um, apologies, uh, I've got to work my way through lots of courses. Okay, I'm about to share. Okay, uh, here we go. So let's just get myself to the Boltzmann distribution quiz and let's make sure that everything is correct that we've got there. So let's have a look at the quiz that we've got here. Um, maybe I shouldn't have said, uh, no, no, that is, that, that's fine. That's, everything is fine that we've got there. So we, what we've got is in carbon-13 NMR and the 14 test magnet, the difference between two energy levels is 1 times 10 to the minus 25 joules. So in the Boltzmann distribution, if you have a look at those slides, you'll remember there is a formula that we have. And I'm just going to try and find it. Um, it's in the second lot of lectures that we've got. So I will share this in a moment. Once I've got it up on my screen, I'm going to share. And um, so let's just see. Uh, so there we go. So here's what we've got. This is what we've got to work with. So what we've got to try and do is we've got that difference there, and um, that's been given to you. That that uh, that difference. Just apologies. The difference in energy um, is one times ten to the minus twenty-five joules. So in here we can put one times ten to the minus twenty-five at the top. K is Boltzmann's constant, and offhand I can't remember it. I know it's uh, related to the gas constant. But have a look, I have placed um, a, uh, a sheet of constants on Are You Connected? So we can easily look up Boltzmann's constant. So have a look at it. Make sure you use the right units for, for Boltzmann constant. Um, so if I can just, so we, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. We need the right units for the Boltzmann constant and the temperature is 298 degrees. So you know all three numbers here, and so you can calculate what this number is over here. So that's what you've got to do first. You've got to find out what is that number over there. And then you've got to realize that, of course, uh, that uh, in the NJ level, you've got a million atoms. So then the question is, how many have you got in the other energy level? Does that make it clear? You're happy that you've got everything you need to calculate this? Yes, it makes clear. Yeah. And then this one is a million here. 
So the question is how many are on that level? Okay. And it's, yeah, to me it's quite interesting because uh, the strength of NMR, uh, the sensitivity of NMR is related to the difference in the levels. So if you've got all of your, all of your particles at, at one energy level and none at another, you've got a really sensitive, you've got a really sensitive instrumental technique. But of course, if we've got the same amount at both levels, then you've got a very, very insensitive uh, technique, and NMR is quite insensitive. So it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. Okay. Um, just email me workings out if you can, if you if you need to. Um, let me just quickly go back to. Um, just hang on a moment to the quiz. Uh, quiz. Um, so if I go back, just let's go back to 301. Just have a look on the sheet now to make sure that we use it right. So there's periodic table and constants. So you go down and Boltzmann constant should be somewhere here. Yes, there we go. So it's a gas constant over Avogadro's, 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. And those are the correct units to be using um, because your energy is in joules, your temperature is in Kelvin, and joules per Kelvin will work well in that uh, Boltzmann distribution. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, please email me uh, if there's a question you want me to deal with in front of the class. I can also do that as well. Okay, and I'll see you then tomorrow at, at 11 o'clock.